<clears throat> All right, can you see the slides? All right, good. Okay, uh, in the previous class, we have learned about <clears throat> the fundamentals of um, MOSFET. So we've learned about the, the device configuration. Um, we've learned about the the field effect uh, mechanism inside uh, the MOSFET. And we've learned about a uh, channel creation uh, where you need to supply uh, a certain polarity of gate voltage at certain level in order to uh, induce channel formation uh, in, for example, um, enhancement mode, okay? Enhancement mode P-type and N-type. And on the other hand, uh, we have also seen the patient mode MOSFET where you already have the channel ready uh, during the fabrication process. So the channel is already built in between source and drain. And the, the transistor will always be on uh, unless you apply uh, the required voltage for, for the for the MOS to be off. Right. On the other hand, if you talk about uh, enhancement mode, you need to apply the right uh, gate voltage in order to induce the channel formation, okay? So we've learned about the inversion layer, we've learned about the <clears throat> flow of majority and minority uh, away from the surface and and towards the surface with the uh, incorporation of the gate voltage in order to create the um, channel. And also, uh, you have learned about uh, the operation regions in, in MOSFET, Right, we've discussed about um, the tri region, the linear region, or the resistive region. And we've also learned about the saturation, uh, VDS, uh, VDS saturation, and then uh, the saturation region, okay? So we've also seen a family of curves uh, of ID VDS with different levels of uh, VGS, okay? The VDS is the drain source voltage and uh, VGS is the gate source voltage, right? So that's the revision of the last section. So today we're gonna look into the combination of uh, MOS, okay? We have learned about PMOS and NMOS respectively. <clears throat> so we're gonna look at complementary metal oxide uh, semiconductor field effect transistor or a CMOS combining P and N, right? So um, when they are combined, they are called CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. And they are used in uh, integrated circuit uh, chips, for example, microprocessors, microcontrollers, uh, memory, and other logic circuits as well. So we are only going to learn about the basic of uh, CMOS operation, but the the actual application of the actual devices depends on um, what sort of combination do we have in, uh, in the real circuits. So analog circuit, for example, such as uh, image, image sensors uh, based on CMOS as well, data converters, RF circuit or RF CMOS, and uh, integrated transceivers for different application or different communication application. So these are among the the applications of the of the CMOS devices. Right. <clears throat> Let's go a little bit into history. So MOSFET was invented by uh, a guy called Muhammad 
Atala is an Egyptian is Egyptian guy, and Dawan Kang. I don't know how to uh, pronounce the name of this uh, Korean guy. That Bell Labs back in 1959. Okay, so it was invented long, long time ago. So that was like um, 60, 40, 60 years ago, more or less, right? So back back in 1959. So the original version, uh, two type MOSFET was uh, fabricated, three type MOS and N type MOS. Uh, back then, it was with dimensions of uh, roughly about 20 micron and then uh, 10 micron back in 1960s. So do you have any ideas of what is the recent dimension of the MOS devices that we have in the market? Any idea? So 60 years ago, back in 1960s, it was like 20 micron. Any idea of the recent dimension that you can see in the market? Anyone? You can write it down there in the chat box. Any guess? Or perhaps what are you using on your laptop or some of the devices or your phones perhaps? What sort of dimensions are we using now? Four nanometer, okay. Yes, four nanometer. Anybody else? Ada, any any other guesses? No. Yeah. So we we are we are we are roughly there. Okay, Sharif, we are roughly there. Good. So we've got um. So we we have now gone down to below uh, ten nanometer, and we have range of. Uh, different technology nodes uh, for a range of different applications. <clears throat> okay, so when you talk about the dimension of the the technology, we we normally we normally say that as technology node. Technology node. So let's look into that uh, very soon. So CMOS uh, was then invented by um, this guy Chi Tas Chi Tang Sa and Frank uh, Wanless at Fairchild back in 1963, and then they published uh, the invention about CMOS uh, in the research paper uh, around that time. So a patent was also filed <clears throat> um, for CMOS circuitry back in 1963 as well, and granted in 1967. So it was like 60 years ago. Uh, the invention. So going forward, since then, since 1963, let's look at the, the trajectory of the reduction in, in dimension. Uh, we have learned about um, CMOS, uh, we have learned about NMOS and PMOS. So this is what you can see on the figure now. So um, recap that uh, the NMOS or PMOS refers to the type of channel that we are using under the gate oxide. So in this case, on the left hand side, uh, you have NMOS where the channel is formed uh, between source and drain and consists of N plus wells. So the, the, the regions there we call, we call them as well. Telaga, telaga. Uh, It's not coming on my screen. So these are called wells, right? So for the left hand side, we have NMOS because the channel is made of N. And for the right hand side, we have PMOS because the channel is made of P. Okay. So P plus to P plus. So therefore, PMOS. And note that if you look at PMOS there, you can see that you have a, a bigger well down there, a bigger well. So this is the well made of n plus a uh, made of n well as if as if you have n type wafer right uh, the one that we learned last time uh, the body is usually the opposite of the channel so this is uh, like a body but it's actually made of a well within another body so if you look at the wafer for example the, the original wafer is p type so we learned last time when we learned about PMOS and NMOS to be able to have a PMOS, we need to use an N-type silicon. 
But in this case, if you look at a physical wafer, the, the substrate here or the body or the wafer is actually p-type. But you have uh, another well there before you form the active region. So you, you use another well here as if it's acting as a body. As if it's acting as a wafer as well, but it's actually um, sitting in uh, a p-type wafer, not, not n-type. So yeah, so well has to be created beforehand before another wells for the P-plus P can be fabricated in the device in order to form the P-MOS. So this is what we will learn when we learn about our device fabrication next semester. Okay, how do you form the well within the well? And then how do you form the smaller wells within a bigger well in order to form your uh, channel, right? So we're going to learn that uh, later on. So if you look at the right hand side uh, on the scaling process notes. So process notes here or technology notes. Normally you'll find articles mentioning technology notes or some also called process note. So this used to refer to the dimension of the gate. Okay, used to. Okay, let's see why no more. Last time it was referred to this. So the gate width or the gate length um, reflects uh, the technology node back then. So we used to refer to this, but in the recent technologies, uh, what you see is not actually representing uh, the, the physical dimension of the gate anymore for a couple of reasons. Okay, for a couple of reasons. So, so let's see how the uh, technology has been scaled down since 1970s. That was like um, 50 years ago, right? So, since the invention of CMOS uh, back in 1963, and the first fabrication was with a gate width of about 20 micron. So this means back then, this was around 20 micron, the width, right? So that determines, the, the physical dimension uh, determines the performance of the device, okay? And this is governed by Moore's law. Anyone has heard about, anyone heard about Moore's law before? Foucault Moore, it's not a, it's not a real law, we say <clears throat> it's not like much of Newton's law. Couple, it's not like that. It's more of an observation, really, but it is called as a law. Okay, so this law you're gonna learn um deeper in four eight seven next semester for those who are taking the course. Uh, this law states that um the the density of transistors will double every two years. Okay, in a sec. The density of transistors will double every two years, and there was also a statement that said uh, the trans the density of the transistors will double every eighteen months, right? And this observation was made by Gordon Moore. Okay, Gordon Moore, so he is one of the founders or co-founders of Intel. So this observation was made in 1965. Okay, when he noticed that the transistor dimension um, reduces in order to accommodate more and more transistors uh, onto the circuit, doing a uh, various job. So uh, in a nutshell, if your transistors can be reduced in dimension, so over the same size, you can pack more and more transistors doing multiple jobs at the same time. So your transistor operation Will be more powerful and the product operation will be more powerful you're going to end up with uh, faster switching and then uh, more power efficient devices and stuff like that so this is pretty much the drive uh, that we have uh, since 1970s since 1960s uh, in order to reduce the dimension of the, the mosfet and this is called scaling okay that's why we call it as mosfet scaling so it's about reducing the dimension of the devices to smaller and smaller over time so that more transistors can be packed onto the same area and they will end up being more powerful, faster switching, uh, more power efficient. Okay. So back in 1971, for example, the size, the physical size, if you're referring to the gate dimension there, the G there, 
uh, it went down to about 10 micron, okay, 10 micron, and then uh, a couple of years later on, uh, reduced to about three micron in the 80s, reduced to about one micron. So let me approve your friend here, hold on. So 1981, uh, 1 1.5 micron. So if you look at the 90s, it went down to 200 plus in nanometer already. So it went down to a uh, sub micron region. So no longer in micron region uh, for CMOS. Okay. And then early 2000, uh, it went down to uh, 130 nanometer. And then um, 2009, 2010, in the 20 to 30 nanometer region. Uh, 2018 about seven and the current technology is sitting around five and we're going to have three nanometer very soon and and tsmc in taiwan taiwan semiconductor manufacturing corporation uh, the world leader in cmos uh, in transistor fabrication uh, is now doing r d on two nanometer and going to produce mass production in in a couple of years i believe right <clears throat> so we are heading towards three and two nanometer and we are heading to the fundamental limit of silicate as well, right? So this is the history of uh, scaling since 1970 plus. So if you talk about Silterra, for example, um, Silterra is capable of doing it down to about 110 nanometer. So just in case if, you, if you're going for an interview, in Silterra next sam for your internship. So it's capable of going down to 110 nanometer um, technology nodes, right? So going below that, it requires massive investment. We're gonna see why, we're gonna see uh, why is it so. Building a single fab in order to fabricate a transistor, how much do you think would be the cost? Any any guess? What would be the cost of building a fab um, to run 100 nanometer process, for example? What do you think? Any guess? To get a complete fabrication line of typical size, how much do you think you need to spend in order to build a fab, a wafer fab? Okay, I got any guess, guys? 500,000 what? Okay, what was your currency? There we are. Ringgit, okay. Uh, Darina said 500,000 ringgit per fab. Okay, other guesses? Let's have three guesses. 500,000, the first one. Second one, come on. Haswani, what do you think? How much do we need to spend to build a fab? If we want to be another cell terra now, what do you think will be the cost? Any guess? Uh, okay. Ringgit. Good. Yeah. So, what's up? Ah, it's Rafaini. Ah, Rafaini. Okay. Is it about 20 ribu? Ringgit. Ah, uh, ringgit. Okay, 20,000. Okay, uh, Hazwani, 500,000 too, I guess. Okay, all right. So we have uh, two 500,000 and one 20,000. Well, a single fab like Silterra costs about 1 billion. Okay, 1,000 million. So it, that's capable of doing down to 100 nanometer, 110 nanometer or so only, right? So if you're talking about the TSMC, uh, SMIC, uh, uh, SMIC, TSMC, all the top guns, Samsung, top, uh, TSMC, uh, Intel, Global Foundries, <clears throat> a single fab uh, like TSMC that's capable of going sub 10 nanometer now, as of 2021, would cost you around 20 billion. 20 billion, okay? And it's not in ringgit, it's in USD. <laughs> so 20 billion USD, okay? So that's like what? 80 billion, 80 billion RM, Ringgit Malaysia. Per fab, yeah? Per fab. So you're gonna see why. Um, it's very expensive. It's, it's a very expensive business. In fact, <clears throat> if you learn about uh, semiconductor fabrication next semester, uh, so if you learn about fabrication next semester, 
I'm going to walk you through every single process, every single equipment that's required to do the fabrication. So we have a range of different processes like lithography, etching, uh, uh, implantation, diffusion, oxidation, blah, 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 many more. Well, I was in lithography back then when, when I was in Sotero. I, I was in charge in uh, one of the uh, lithography equipment. And a single piece of the equipment costs around 30 million euro. A single piece, satu equipment, yeah? Just one piece of equipment. The size is about um normally if I if I if I'm conducting this class in DK at open a tutorial room, I can show the size. So the size is about uh three quarter of a BT, BT tutorial. If you can imagine, BT 145, BT146, perhaps uh, a single piece of equipment, uh, the size is about three quarter or so of about BT146. So three quarter, seventy five percent of that size, and that's costing around thirty million euros per piece. And to be able to run uh, a production, you need at least about twenty of those. And that is only for a single process, single equipment set only. You're, you're not talking about other equipment in lithography yet. The measuring equipment, the SEM, and the coating, and some other stuff for alignment. And that's just lithography. You need 20 just to give you some perspective. And this is only lithography. We're not talking about etching yet, uh, oxidation yet, diffusion yet, uh, thin film dietary, metallization, CMP, blah, blah, blah. And that's coming into a billion or so for just a decent fab, like 100 nanometer capability. If you're talking about TSMC scale and capability, we're talking in the range of 20 billion or so, right? For a single fab, right? Single fab. So that's why it's a very expensive business. And that's one of the reasons why Kazana, if you if you follow the news, Kazana can't kind afford of to uh, keep funding Silterra because the operation expenses is already uh, skyrocketing. Okay. So that's uh, some of the part of the of the stories, just to link to this technology node and capability and the cost and stuff like that. So it's not only about selling fab to other people and that's it. It, it's money behind that, right? It's money and the continuous funding and sustainability for the future, stuff like that, uh, at the expense of the technology that we are we are owning, right? So that's the thing. So CMOS, when we talk about CMOS, we are talking about a simple, for, for example, this is an, a, a simple example for you to appreciate um, uh, the operation of a CMOS. So CMOS can be uh, an inverter or a not logic gate. So you have learned in digital electronics, right? If you input zero and then you're going to get one at the output and if if you input one and you're going to get zero at the output right you learned that in first year isn't it so if you look at this for example uh, this inverter circuit the t1 is referring to nmos oh sorry copy trucks t1 is for nmos and uh, t2 is pmos you look at the label there you can also see this uh, in the videos that I have uploaded on the ELAN, right? So NMOS is uh, T1 and T2 because hole is there. You can see that's the hole. So that's defining the majority carriers in the device or the channel, which is P. So the nature of NMOS is whatever it's uh, received, whatever it receives, it will input the very same uh, instruction. So for an NMOS, if it receives one as the input, it will input one. If it receives zero, it will input zero as well. On the other hand, if you're talking about PMOS, if it receives zero, then it will flip the output to one. If it receives uh, one, it will flip the output to zero. Okay. So let's look at a simple circuit like this, an inverter. So if you input um, a zero, so this is the input, this is the output, this is the VDD, the supply voltage, and this is the ground. Just to demonstrate that working principle. So if you have zero here, so NMOS will take will will be zero then will be zero it will take zero as zero then the the T T one will be off okay T one will be off because it, it is zero so that means it's not on and uh, PMOS will invert so T PMOS will make zero as one so this the T two will be on the transistor two will be on and therefore when the transistor two is on 
this VR is connected to VDD, right? VR is then connected to VDD. So it's taking the value of VDD and you're going to get one as your output, right? So your VR will be one and that's where you get VR as one. So you can see now when you input zero, you're going to get one. So that is basically an inverter or a not logic gate, right? So that is for zero as the input. So let's look at the second case. If you use um, V in as one, so if you use V in as one, so you now use one as your V in. So what is going to happen next is um, T1 will take one as one and T1 will be on. So T1 is on. Sorry, one. One is one. T1 will be off. Well, hold on. V in is one. T1 is off. T2 is off. Oh no, yeah. Uh, v in is one. So it's one. It's connected. Okay, T1 is always connected. Then T2 is. T2 is inverted. T2 is off. Ah, okay, something's wrong here. Because this one should be on. This one should be on. Then when it's connected, so this V out is connected to the ground. Right? T2 is off. T2 is off means um, when you input one, your T2 is off. So here is not connected. It represents as an open circuit. So your VDD is not connected to V out, but V out is taking the ground value, right? Because this one is connected. Okay, this one is connected. So then your V out will be zero because your V out is taking the ground state value. So that one will be zero then. So that's why you're getting V out as zero when your V1, uh, V in is one, right? So it's, all, it's also showing an inverted gate, right? So that's why it's used in, in, in an inverter circuit. So what you input is, um, is the opposite of what you get, right? So that's basically an inverter. You can also see for the uh, NAND gate and other gates, it can appear as different combination as well. So on the right hand side is the circuitry if you get to do the design. Okay, when you talk about fabrication or semiconductor fabrication, it's not only about the fabrication, it comes with the design first. It starts off with the design. We, we can look at one fabricated, and then you're going to eventually end up as your circuit, right? So you need to do the design. This is where the design engineers are coming in, the one who designed the circuitry. Typically, Can you hear me now? I think I was uh, disconnected for a while. Oh, okay, okay, that's good. But just now it's showing up as uh, trying to connect on my line. It's raining here, so the line's not good. Okay, not connected. Good, let's go back to the slides. Um, okay, let me reshare. Okay, can you see the slides again? Okay. Can you see, right? Okay, good. So let's move on. So that's 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 the role of a design engineer. Okay, so if you're um, if you're learning some design, uh, typically e students, they learn the software and package to, to do the design, they will end up doing uh, this design. For example, uh, in Malaysia, we have uh, Intel, for example, or Altera. Altera is already acquired by Intel. Is doing the design, the circuit before the actual fabrication. Intel. Okay. Right. Um, when you talk about the scaling, when you talk about scaling, 
one important factor will be uh, the choice of gate oxide. Okay, the GO here. So the GO, the gate oxide, has to be uh, chosen carefully, right? So you, we don't want you, you don't want to have leakage across the gate ox because when you do the scaling, the thickness of the gate oxide will be scaled accordingly. So that means the gate oxide thickness will reduce. Uh, with reduced uh, technology loads. So for the gate ox, uh, we need to use a material with high dielectric constant or kappa. So for the gate ox, right? So the current technology utilizes silicon dioxide as the gate oxide. So this is the common uh, gate oxide that we are using in the current uh, technologies. So uh, it's used in semiconductor manufacturing with a fat process to replace a uh, silicon dioxide gate dielectric or another dielectric layer. So we need to come up with another uh, options uh, for gate materials to eventually replace silicon dioxide <clears throat> if we need to, right? So one several as one of the several strategies developed to allow miniaturization of microelectronic component extending MOS law. So choosing the right uh, material for the gate oxide is crucial in order to make sure that the transistor is performing uh, the desired function as intended. So silicon dioxide has been used as the gate material for decades. So you can see uh, in figure five down here, the TM image of SiO2 with high uh, K, high K gate uh, dielectric. So you can see here the thickness of the gate oxide is only around 1.2 nanometer, very, very thin. Right, so you have your gate there, sitting on the gate oxide, and then your silicon here. And if you draw completely the the MOSFET, then you're going to see your source grain right inside. Right, so this is the gate oxide, preventing the leakage. Right, so MOSFET decrease in size, SO2 thickness steadily decreases as well to increase gate capacitance. So the the role here is to increase gate capacitance, and thereby increasing the drive current raising device performance. So we want to increase the drive current in the device as we do the scaling, and that has to be uh, ensured by increasing the gate capacitance through reduced uh, gate oxide thickness. So thickness below two nanometer leakage current due to tunneling increases drastically. So we've discussed about tunneling. Uh, we talked about the physics last time and when the thickness is very, very thin, the possibility of tunneling is higher and higher. And what will happen? What do you think will happen if you're going to get tunneling in your devices? In your MOS, if you do the switching, if you have tunneling at the same time, what do you think will happen to the device? Any ideas at this point of time? If you have carriers uh, going through the, the oxide when you don't want to, what will happen to the operation of the device? Can you switch the device off? Anyone? Most of it is a switch, right? You want to switch on and off at high frequency. So you want to turn on and turn off by regulating the, the VG, for example. We learned about uh, turning on and turning off of the, um, of the NMOS uh, N-type enhancement, for example, by applying the VG. You can actually modulate the, the IDS, right? So can you turn off the device, do you think? If you turn the device off, if you turn the voltage off, for example, and the device is supposed to be off, but at the same time you you're still having carriers crossing through the oxide at the same time, and that will result in current flow as well. Okay, you're gonna get leakage current, and when you get leakage current, so there's a high possibility that you cannot turn off the device, so you cannot control the switching okay, as a result. So, this is why uh, the choice of the dielectric is crucial in order to make sure that the device follows the operation principle as intended, okay? So tunneling increase are leading to high power consumption and reduce device reliability. 
Okay, hypoassumption, you're not supposed to have currents flowing at the same time, but you have current flowing at that uh, particular time, and then reduce device reliability because it's no longer reliable. You want it to be off, but it's not off. So therefore it's not reliable. So replacing SiO2 gate, so the gate oxide replacement with a high K material, which are other materials, allows increase of gate capacitance. So you want to keep increasing the gate capacitance without having leakage effects, right? So if you don't use high K dielectric material to replace uh, with the reduced uh, technology loads, we're going to end up with more and more leakage current that will affect the device performance. So gate oxide uh, in a MOSFET can be modeled as a parallel plate capacitor. So you learned about capacitor last time. So you essentially have uh, two metal plates. For example, you have two metal plates and then you have uh, a space in between, okay, a space in between. And this space is represented by, by the gate ox. So if you look at the capacitance that you learned last time, so you have two parallel plates and then you have nothing in between, for example, and this is um, reflecting, or this is actually illustrating the gate ox. Okay, so you can model as uh, this configuration. <clears throat> so ignoring quantum mechanical and depletion effects from silicon substrate and the gate, capacitance of the gate oxide can be calculated as. <clears throat> so the C is due is calculated as kappa, the dielectric uh, constant, k times the epsilon, the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught times the area uh, in between, and over the the capacitor the the oxide thickness, okay? So that's how you calculate the, the capacitance of the device. So A is the capacitor area, uh, K is the dielectric constant, so you have uh, a specific value for different materials. For example, 3.94 SL2, you're gonna see uh, different values for different materials as well. So epsilon naught is a permittivity of free space. You need to uh, calculate by using the uh, relative permittivity right, uh, and times the dielectric constant in order to get the value, and thickness, T is the uh, the oxide thickness, right? <clears throat> so you can also have something like this, gate and three nanometer high K uh, dielectric, for example, and silicon is the silicon wafer, okay? So the left-hand side uh, shows the 90 nanometer process. So if you're looking at the current technology node of 90 nanometer, so this is how it looks like pretty much, okay? And uh, if you look, if you go for lower technology node, then you're gonna go for something uh, on the right side. But capacitance is increased by about 1.6 times higher and leakage is minimized by this much. So it's only like uh, migrating from one times to 0 0.01 uh, X of the previous time, right? So that's like 1% of the leakage current uh, compared to the, the one on the left, right? So the K in this case is about 16. So we're talking about a high K dietary. You want a K to be as high as possible in order to increase the gate capacitance and um, thereby increasing the drive current. So if you look at this equation, for example, C is proportional to the kappa, right? K, uh, kappa is proportional to the C. So if you increase this K, you can increase the C and then you can increase the drive current uh, in the device. So leakage limitation constraints further reduction of T. So if you if you can't replace uh, the dielectric material with uh, a high K value dielectric material, so it's hard to reduce the thickness because it's going to result in higher leakage current right through through the dielectric material. So alternative method is to increase gate capacitance. So is to alter the kappa value by replacing SL2 with another high K dielectric material. And we've learned that <clears throat> the K of silicon dioxide is only 3.9, right? Silicon is only 3.9. So you want to go beyond 3.9 then, in that case. To reduce leakage current flowing through the structure as well as improving K dielectric reliability. Okay, you want it to be reliable according to the intended operation. So the candidates are for the high K dielectric, you can go for hafnium silicate, zirconium silicate, hafnium oxide, hafnium dioxide, zirconium dioxide, 
typically deposited using ALD process. Atomic layer deposition. We're going to learn about this process in 4.7 uh, next semester. So if you look at a periodic table and try to relate to the um, dark constant that we're talking about, so you want to go on this uh, graph on the right. You want to go to the right as far as possible because you want to have as high as possible dielectric constant in order to replace uh, the gate oxide. Okay, so the choices here are see, you can see silicon dioxide is somewhere here that's about 3.9 or 4 more or less. And then you have range of other materials with increasing dietary constant, like uh, AL203 is somewhere near 10. And then you can also see hafnium dioxide is about 24, 25. You can barium oxide, that's about 32, 33. <clears throat> Titanium dioxide up to 50 something, right? So range of different materials with different bank gap as well. That has to be uh, equally considered uh, in the device. And drain current, okay, drain current, you want to uh, increase gate capacitance in order to increase the gate current, uh, the drive current. So the drain current uh, for a MOSFET can be uh, written as the below equation ID, for example. And then it depends on W over L. If you remember last time we talked about the 3D structure of your MOSFET, for example. And for example, if this is your gate, on gate ox. So that's pretty much what you have what you have across the device. For a gate ox and the gate. So the length will be here. The length of the gate. Then the W, the width will be here. Okay, W and L. So one of the main contributing factors in um, determining the drive current, right? So then, um, so W is the width, L is the uh, length, mu is the channel carrier mobility. So you need to see whether your channel is uh, uh, dominated by hole or electrons. So if it's an NMOS, it is electron. If it's PMOS and hole, so you need to see the mu value of E or mu value of H, for example. And then the C value is the capacitance associated with the gate dielectric. Right, when the channel is in inverted state, right? Inverted state, that means the channel is running, it's operational. Then the VG and VTH is given. We've learned uh, last time about the transistor gate voltage. The VG apply on the gate and the threshold voltage that needs to be over overcome in order to turn the device on, right? So we need to input all these uh, important parameters in order to come to uh, the current calculation. I'll give you some examples, uh, perhaps today or tomorrow on the on the calculation, to to show you how to use uh, the parameters in the in the MOSFET in order to calculate the drain current. Okay. So yeah, we're done with uh, MOSFET. So we have done. We have covered. We have covered all the. Uh, topics in the in the course okay so um any questions so far or anything on the test upcoming tests next two days any questions no all good so tomorrow I'm gonna give you a free time so we've covered the syllabus already, by the way. Uh, I'm going to give you a free time. Yes, you asked already last time. Yes, we're going to have uh, some calculations as well in test number two. Test number two, but type juga. Uh, yes. Yes, you can. You, you need to type as well. So, so with regard to calculations, that means you can you can type the calculations, all right? So test number two, we're going to do on uh, this Tuesday. Can you use it? So was it was it in handwritten? Sorry, last time was it handwritten test? 
Was it a type test? Sorry, I couldn't remember last time. Can return, right? Yeah, yeah, handwritten. Sorry, sorry, I got that wrong. I got that wrong. Yes, it has to be handwritten. Yeah, luckily you ask. Yeah, yes, it has to be a handwritten test. Okay, handwritten test. Um, and then the yeah, no problem to do the calculation there. <clears throat> it's a lot easier, in fact, to do uh, the calculations in writing. Ah, tak boleh. Inject ke? Uh, Arisha, I'm sorry. So in that case, okay. In that case, okay. For, for, your, for your case, it's fine. Yep, yep. Submit in PDF form. Oh, really? You have your own cat? Or stray cat? Ah, okay then. No choice. Own cat. Okay, okay. Right, right, right. All right then. So no choice. Yep. Uh, PDF just as last time. Okay. So we're going to have a mix of uh, calculations and descriptive or analytical questions, just like last time. Uh, we're going to cover from PN junction bias uh, up to the end of the topic, of the final uh, topics. Uh, it's going to take three hours this time. <clears throat> last time it was four hours, right? Yeah, last time it was one to five. And this time it's going to be one to four. Okay. It's going to be open book as well. Um, yeah. Any other questions on the test? Right. So what's the time period you need to submit the PDF? Uh, by 4 p.m. then. Three hours. Um, Three questions, yes. Last time was four hours, right? Uh, and sorry, four questions, right? Okay. So, okay, open book. Any other questions on the test? So you can do your revision tomorrow, uh, no class. And I'm gonna, mm, hold on. Tomorrow is what, uh, Tuesday and then Wednesday and Friday, let me see Friday. I'm gonna have a, a revert, where, Friday, I know, uh, Thursday, right? Thursday, Thursday is, yeah, I'm going to have a review class with you on uh, Thursday. Thursday morning, we're going to have a review class just to recap uh, everything from day one until the final uh, topic. Well, usually this is uh, very crucial if you want to uh, face your final exam. But in this case, we are not facing any final exam, but just a test that's done a day before. So I'm just going to recap on what is important, what is Uh, crucial um, for your next. So I got a report on WebEx here. Can can you still see me and hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, uh, can you see me now? Oh, I got a, I just got a report on my uh, window that said uh, Webex, Webex crash, crash report. I don't know why. <laughs> the Debo Webex crash on my, on my page. Oh, I don't know, for whatever reason. The recent version already. So anyway, okay, we're gonna have your test one, uh, test two on uh, Wednesday, and uh, we're gonna have a review class on Thursday to wrap up. So it's already week number, it's already week fifteen, right? And um, uh, I'm gonna 
announce to you your coursework mark, not everything, uh, some of your coursework marks sometimes, I believe sometime next week. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to let you know some of the coursework marks from your previous uh, submission. Okay. Any other last questions? And, uh, all good. Okay, then, so no class tomorrow. Uh, do your revision accordingly. And then uh, I'll see you virtually uh, in on, on Wednesday about, about on during the test one time, okay? Test two time, okay? I'll let you know when the, the questions are uploaded on the system already. 1 to 4 p.m., right? So all the best to everyone. Bye-bye, take care. Assalamualaikum. Stay safe. Thank you.